All right, hello and welcome. Uh, this is, of course, holding powerful first meetings, and I had to put a really catchy tagline, so you know that double your pipeline. But I'll actually show you that uh, that is true. Really excited about today. Uh, this presentation came together really, really well. It, it frankly is a gosh, a shame, I'll say, an embarrassment that I uh, that I haven't done this previously. Um, really important topic. Um, for sales, right? And, and as I said in some of the pre-material and on the landing page, I truly believe that how you run your first meeting with a prospect very much determines, not always, of course, you gotta have a little hyperbole in there, but very much determines the rest of your relationship. And we work so hard to get first meetings, a lot of prospecting, a lot of cold calling. Um, if we don't do this right, the rest of the, the thing uh, doesn't, doesn't, line up to our expectations. So usually I got some disclaimers. Um, the approach I'm sharing with you is most relevant, as it says, for B2B selling, right? Higher end consultative kind of stuff. Uh, you can use it in other environments, but this is not for a one call close kind of environment. I have clients that, that do do that and those are very different. Typically for one call closes, you need a lot more stuff to happen before the, the meeting ever occurs. But this is really about, you know, what hopefully most of us are here for, which is, your typical run of the mill, uh, business to business, higher dollar, you know, there's a lot of SaaS these days, but they can still be bigger dollar contracts, um, where the buying environments are complex, intricate, intimate, things like that. If you don't know about my prospecting approach, if you haven't, you know, been on a webinar with me ever before, this may feel pretty strange. There's some weird stuff in here. And, you know, one of the points I wanted to make is this is not a standalone technique for how do you do first meetings, right? If, 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 if you think you're going to come here and get kind of a, you know, quick fix, apply it to your first meetings and not change anything else about how you sell. I, 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 I'm unfortunately going to have to tell you, you're going to be very disappointed in that. Um, good news is I have all my other webinars. How do I prospect? How do I close all that stuff? They're up on my YouTube channel. I did just set up a playlist. So all of my previous uh, master classes are in the same spot. Um, that link will be included in the, um, in the, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the follow-up email with the, uh, with the recording and all that stuff. But this is not you know, a quick fix, just implement some things and then your whole world's gonna change. This is a systematic approach to, to frankly selling very differently. Whenever I'm teaching, whenever I'm showing folks stuff, when I'm trying to lead folks to something new, I think it's important to, to agree on what does better look like? Why are we even doing this? Why does something need, why does something need to change? And, and why do I, who the heck am I to believe that I have uh, something more powerful, right? Why do I call it powerful first meetings? I hold powerful first meetings. The truth is that I use the term better, right? My system is better. My process is better because it delivers superior results, right? Superior results in terms of what happens in the sales process. And if you look at a, a typical sales process, these are, you know, you could get more comprehensive, less comprehensive, but the, the idea is in general, we can agree that there's activity, calls, email stuff we have to do. There's human interaction, meaning you actually get somebody to respond to an email or talk to you. You have a first conversation, right? The first time they're going to talk to you. Ideally, you move to some sort of discovery. Uh, at that point, we're trying to identify is this opportunity qualified versus the prospect qualified. And then either you close the deal or you don't. If you look at this stuff, as I have for the past two decades, what's interesting is these numbers as benchmarks across you know, the, the, the world, not just the industry, really haven't changed much. Eight to 12% of the activity you perform will result in human interaction, right? That's true for cold calls. That's also true for email, right? People are sort of fixated these days, I think, with not making cold calls, not making, you know, not using the phone to prospect. The funny part is the connect rate is about the same, eight to 12%. Um, converting human interaction to a first scheduled meeting, most of the time when I walk in the door, most of the clients I talk to, are performing at less than 25%, meaning it takes four human conversations to even get a single meeting. That's a pretty poor ratio. And I, I frankly, I see uh, ratios, conversions that are even worse than that, that are in the 10% range. Once the first meeting is held, moving that onto discovery, what I see very consistently is 25%. From discovery to qualified opportunity, about one and two will advance to that. And then in a typical pipeline from a qualified op, at 20% probability, one in five will close and, and be one. This is a very normal, very predictable, very uh, uh, 
natural, you know, commonly occurring process with, with, with conversions. The reality is it's very difficult to improve something in the pipeline. If your pipeline's built correctly, 20% opportunities close one in five. That's how statistics work. Uh, it is also almost impossible to improve the conversion of activity to human interaction, right? You can monkey with subject lines and emails. You can do some tricks on the phone, but at the end of the day, it is a numbers game. There's not a lot of movement there. I can't make somebody pick up the phone. I can't train you to, uh, to get somebody to lift the receiver on their headset and put it on their ear. However, these two areas for me, have always represented the, the, the greatest opportunity for improvement, right? So that's where I focus a lot of my time. How do we prospect better, make better cold calls so that I convert at a higher rate when they answer. And then when I have a first meeting, how do I get those to convert to a second meeting, i.e. discovery more often? In my model, right, when I work with clients, as I have for the past two decades, these are the minimum numbers I see, right? Those numbers move from 25% less than to a benchmark of 50% and greater. I've got some clients who consistently can convert three out of four live conversations to a meeting using my process. And again, you can go hunt down that video. And from a first scheduled meeting to an advance to a discovery, my benchmark is one out of two, at least one out of two. I actually prefer two out of three, but I didn't want to be too greedy on this slide. And as you'll see in a second, the math works better. That's a 400% increase, right? If you simply change some techniques up here, you have more quantity that makes it down to the bottom and thus can convert to a closed one deal. So that's why I said that the first scheduled meeting process I'm going to show you today literally will double your pipeline, if not increase it more than that. You combine that with the prospecting tools and techniques that I have, you're looking at 4x improvement in the overall pipeline and ultimately you'll close more business. It's pretty simple. So this is what we're playing for today, right? This is the why you should perhaps watch this, listen to this, pay attention to this and adopt this, right? If you do this, you will get better results. I've helped companies for a long, long time and it helps them. So that's why we're doing this today. So let's get cracking. Few words about how I teach. Um, those of you who've been on other webinars have seen a version of this slide. I keep adding to it. I have an obsession with yellow Volkswagen Beetles and there's a simple reason for it. Everybody in the world knows what a yellow Volkswagen Beetle looks like, right? We got the old one. I think I saw that in Mexico someplace. We got the new fancy convertible one, but we know what they look like. It is impossible for you to erase the image of a yellow Volkswagen Beetle from your mind. You can't unlearn what it is. You can't unsee a yellow Volkswagen Beetle. In fact, I will promise you that after watching this presentation over the next week, you're going to see these suckers everywhere. I see them everywhere. This one's off my balcony up here, that little one, you know, see kind of speeding by. But I swear every single day I see one of these suckers because I know they exist. And for me, they're very important as a symbol of the way you help people change, the way you help people uh, learn about and embrace, you know, something new that's, that's different, that's uncomfortable, is you don't worry about trying to have them get the whole thing right? There's so many details. There's, there, there's, there's the need to practice, you know, and implement and learn and develop. But if, if I can simply show you something you haven't seen before, share with you a truth, right? That you didn't know about before, you will move naturally and, and frankly, fairly effortlessly towards that truth, right? It's actually not a lot of work. Bader Meinhof phenomena. Exactly. You'll see this stuff everywhere. Thank you, Maury. Um, that is the principle of how I teach. It's my job to show people yellow Volkswagen Beetles. What I just showed you on the slide before is you could be doing four times better with not any more effort. Hopefully that's going to stick in your brain and that'll keep us moving here. A few words about sales process. Uh, I've been doing this a long time and it's sort of funny when I used to talk about sales process and those of you who've known me for, for a while and you know who you are on this call know that it used to take a lot of time and effort and words and hand gestures and diagrams to explain how does sales work, right? And, and my whole thing is things that are powerful are simple, right? Powerful concepts are actually very, very simple. One of the reasons they're so challenging to get is because they are so damn simple, right? And, and, and we have this resistance to things as simple. We have resistance to things that are simple being powerful. Oh, it can't be that easy. Well, it really is. Um, I'm sharing with you on this nice page here uh, what after doing this for 
two decades, and, and I love saying that because it's hilarious. Um, sales process looks like. It's pretty simple. There's four sta stages. There's prospecting, there's discovery, there's decision, there's contracting. You can read this. It's actually in the uh, little packet that you'll get or I said in, in the Dropbox. But the idea is this is not very complicated. Go find people to talk to, get them to talk to you once, keep the conversation going to learn about them, right? At the point where you've uncovered or they've shared a problem with you, right? Now you can play a game called, let's see if we can actually help you with that. And then there's the contracting crap on the end, right? The bureaucratic activities, you know, that come culminate in a legally binding agreement, do business, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. This is sales process, very simple. We are talking about, if I had to draw something here, the very start of discovery, right? The only goal of prospecting is to get the first meeting, not to generate interest, not to stimulate curiosity, not to probe for need, not to qualify. You cannot do that in an interruption. That's another webinar. You can go watch that. In order to move to discovery, I have to get you to agree to meet with me and, and thus move from the world of interruption, cold calling, cold emailing to conversation in a scheduled context. So, we are mastering or hopefully starting the process of mastering right in here. I don't know if you can see my little mouse wiggling the very beginning of discovery, which I believe is the most important process of selling and the most challenging process. Ready, steady, go. Scope for conversation today, right? We're talking about holding the first meeting. I'm not going to help you set it. I've got other webinars on that other masterclasses. Go check them out. We're talking about meetings with prospects that come from demand creation, i.e. outbound efforts. Also, prospect meetings that come from demand response, i.e. inbound. Hey, we're calling schedule a demo, right? As, as you'll see in a little bit, uh, I think the schedule a demo as the hook to start a conversation with somebody is, is absolutely the worst, most destructive phenomenon that happens in sales today. However, it is a reality, right? People uh, in your marketing departments and your companies still have that schedule a demo button on the website should be removed and X'd out, but it's there. So the scope of our conversation does include these demand response, schedule a demo. When I think about demand response though, I'm more interested in what's happening now with you know, inbound marketing where companies are producing content and, and trying to get customers to say, hey, let's have a conversation. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. A couple of years ago, I went to the uh, Internet Marketer Conference down in, uh, uh, where was it? San Diego. And I'll, I'll skip the whole story, but Ryan Dice, who's the, the president of, of Internet Marketer, had a very powerful um, concept. He said, all we ever sell is transformation from their less than desirable current state to their more desirable future state. I've modified that a little bit because I think it's more appropriate for sales, but I'm going to actually show this slide twice because it's so important. So work with me here. The only thing you ever sell, the only thing anybody ever gives you money for is support, assistance, help along their journey from their current situation to their desired future. Nobody wants your SaaS, you know, application. Nobody wants your database. Nobody wants your, you know, most new uh, powerful phone system. Nobody wants your freight shipping services. They don't want them. They'd rather stop spending money and just, sit there and eat bonbons and watch Oprah or something. However, they interact with vendors, they spend money, they invest, when they are on a journey from where they are to where they wanna be, and they are somehow impeded in the process of getting there, right? Very important, this is all we ever sell. Your value proposition has to align to their journey, their current situation, their desired future. I'm not going to go through the slide as I do that in other places, but here is an example of, of what I call the buyer journey, right? The stages that buyers naturally go through um, when they move to make a purchase, right? People don't wake up one day and say, I'm buying a new car today, or I'm buying a new house, or I'm going to you know, get a divorce and remarry somebody else. Those things happen over time, right? And the human mind has a very predictable path that it follows to move from everything's fine right over on the left hand side would be status quo a blue sky sunny day perfect temperature everything's great and then something catches our attention right we discover the seed of need you know a small problem or opportunity right oh there's water bubbling up from my floor right huh wonder if that's a problem at some point maybe there's more water 
we move into the process of learning about what's going on. Well, let me see where else there's water. Let me see if I can find any other spots. Let me pull up some floorboards. Let me also see what I can do about it. Look in the phone book or phone book. That's, that's that. There's an anachronism. Uh, go online and go on Yelp and see whether plumbers are, et cetera, get some estimates. But I still may not be ready to yet solve for it. Just because I'm interacting with vendors does not mean I have decided to solve this problem. Very, very important, right? We exist, salespeople, to present solutions that solve customer problems. The existence of a problem in our eyes does not represent a buying opportunity because we're not the buyer, right? They must be ready to solve for the problem. And one of the things I always point out is there's a delay always between acknowledgement of something going on and actual decision to take action to do something about it. And you can think about this in your own lives, right? Where, well, think about it this way. I guarantee there are things in your life that are not as they should be. Could be personal, your weight, uh, your, your level of physical fitness, um, could be how much reading you do, could be, you know, how much knowledge you have, could be, you know, you want a better house, could be, you know, a million things. You want to rearrange your sock drawer. Well, just because you acknowledge it as a problem doesn't mean you have the time, energy, and capital to do something about it. So it's very important we understand that, right, where they are because our actions need to meet theirs. When somebody calls you up and says, hey, we're looking to buy this, blah, 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 well, let's do a demo. Well, I really would love to believe that they are ready to solve, ready to spend some money. That's not necessarily the case. We'll talk more about that. The underlying dysfunction of selling, particularly when we talk about top of the funnel and getting the first meeting, is we, we, have this, we have this belief that there's got to be a hook. We have to have a reason to meet. We have to have a fancy, snazzy product. We have to have a cool, catchy value proposition, et cetera. So we're selling the meeting based on interest and excitement and trying to get them all excited. Well, that interest and excitement, even if it exists, has a very, very steep decline in terms of its half-life, right? You catch the foot, you catch the back, you catch the fish your hook is baited for. Part of the problem of first meetings, again, we're not going to deal with this today, but part of the problem of first meetings is the way we're setting them, show you my product, see how cool it is, show you how it can help, sets us up for all the other problems downstream, right? So we need to set the meeting differently. Today, I will tell you what the meeting needs to look like. We're not going to get into the exactly how of how do you set that meeting, but like I said, go check out my other presentation for that. But I will tell you, it is how the first meeting is set and what you're doing on the first meeting that is causing all your problems. And let's talk about those problems, right? Cancellations and no-shows, those are problems, right? My benchmark is 85%, meaning 85% of your meetings should show if you're following all the correct processes and procedures. 15% would be the no-show rate. Half of those should be able to get rescheduled. Clients, people that don't follow this process, 50, 60% no-shows. That's a problem we're gonna solve for. No advance for an opportunity, so they show up, but there's no advance, right? I talk about, I want at least 50% of those to move forward. Most people are seeing 25%. I'll tell you a bigger problem, probably the most insidious underlying problem that I hope we can solve for this process is you set the meeting, you get the meeting, you're all excited, it advances to an opportunity, but the dreaded no decision. 80% of opportunities in pipeline end in no decision. They didn't buy from somebody else. They didn't choose to build it. They just stopped talking to you. They wandered off after you invested all your time and energy, all that energy, 80% of what you do is being thrown in the trash. Just think about that for a second. If you could stop no decision deals, right? To me, the only acceptable rate of no decision opportunities from proposal is zero. Well, no surprise, right? This is a typical sales interaction map. Outreach calls, phones, use all the fancy dialers, use the outreach.io, blah, blah, blah. We got a meeting. Well, what happens in the meeting? You got some SDR, BDR pitching, come talk to my sales guy. He's going to show you. We want to tell you. We got to, you got to see this. It's amazing, right? Well, maybe you do impress them. Maybe they are excited by the technology. Guess where that leads us? And you guys put this in your questions, right? Hey, send us a proposal. And then what do you do? Follow up, follow up, wait, wait, wait. Follow up, follow up, wait, wait, wait. It's like a cool little rap song right? This is the problem. If this is your sales map, right? If this is how you sell, that's why you're getting those results in the previous slide. This is an effective sales interaction map. This is an interaction map that I would use with a team that I was coaching to sell. Wow, look at all those boxes. Isn't that a lot more work? Doesn't it slow down the sales cycle? Maybe, 
but we don't have things like no decision. We don't get all the way through the end and then that prospect vanishes, right? We close these deals because we didn't sell out in front of the customer. Not gonna get into this a lot today because we're talking about, remember, first meeting, but I want you to have some context. The first meeting that you're setting today, as it's set up, dooms you to this. You have to change what you're doing, change your actions and your beliefs if you want to experience different results. Remember I said this, all we ever sell is help along their journey from their current situation where they are today to their desired future. Just because we see inefficiency, just because we think they have a problem, doesn't mean there is one, doesn't mean they're actually looking to solve for that problem, doesn't mean they want our help, right? I should have put the slide up here, but I didn't. It's going to be the little kit that I send. Selling, consummation of a, of, of a relationship requires three things. A problem that the prospect acknowledges, not that we tell them they have, and they go, yeah, that's going to be a problem, right? It's got to be specific. Commitment to action. Having a problem is not enough if they have not demonstrated they're committed to action. Yeah, we're going to do something about it. It's mission critical. That's not commitment to action. One of my favorite questions is, okay, there's this problem here. What have you done so far to try and solve for this? Well, I called you. Calling a vendor is not commitment to action, right? It's testing the waters. It's a budgetary exercise. Problem, commitment to action, and they have to want help, right? Once I've identified a problem, and I know there's commitment to action, and, I, and they can show me, well, we've tried this, we've tried this. My next question is, do you really want my help? Have you tried this enough yourselves to be ready to spend some money with somebody who can do this and help you solve it? once and for all. That's a very important question, even if it's scary, right? Because we're terrified the prospect's gonna say, well, no, I'm actually just kind of picking your brain so I can do it myself. But that's what they're doing. Those no decisions, that was a very, very expensive for us exercise in educating the customer so they could try some things on their own, right? That's what that was. So why do we fail if, if all we need are these things, right? Well, we may fail to capture complete understanding of the current state, right, in, in that, in that truncated interaction map, there's no way you can capture a complete understanding of their current state, where they see themselves today. I love people who say, well, we do discovery, usually the first 15 minutes of the demo. That's not discovery, that's chit chat. We fail to capture a complete understanding of their desired future, right? Where do you wanna be? Well, what we're doing today is not working. That is not a problem statement, right? That's like saying it's raining outside. Well, I see it's raining, who cares? Well, I wanna go outside, okay, so what's the problem? Well. I'm gonna get wet still, what's the problem? Use an umbrella jacket. Well, I'm wearing my nice linen suit, it'll get ruined. Oh, now we're closer to a problem, right? We typically deal in symptoms. Most of what we do today and the reason we spend so much time and energy on deals that don't close is because we take the little symptomatic pain that they share with us. Oh, it's not working today, we wanna to do better and it's mission critical. And we get so excited because we finally have somebody who will talk to us and we say, oh, I know what their goal is, but that's not really a goal, is it? Finally, they fail to develop a complete understanding of either or both. One of the things that's really, really important to understand, and I do a lot of, you know, we'll call it personal individual performance coaching. Like, hey, I want to have a better career. I want to be happier. I want to, you know, you've seen my free from fear stuff, right? When I sit down with somebody, I ask a couple of questions. Where do you want to be? What's, what's, what's better look like? And I make them write it down. And what I get is a bunch of gibberish, right? It's not their fault. They've never been taught to create clear, concise, compelling statements of the future. Well, I wanna be happy, I wanna be in a good relationship, I wanna meet somebody who loves me, I wanna have enough money, right? Those sound like desired futures, but they're not. They're concepts. Imagine you walk into a you know, travel agent, not that they exist anymore, and you say, hey, I wanna go on vacation. Where do you wanna go, sir? Well, I wanna go someplace nice. Okay, well, uh, tell me more. Well, I, well we wanna have fun, right? How the heck can the tra travel agent help you, right? Now, what the travel agent can do is just start, you know, throwing trips at you. Well, how about this? Let me bid you this. Let me quote you this, right? Well, I may get it right, but I'm sure burning a lot of time and I haven't qualified, haven't done a lot of other things to determine if this deal is ever going to happen. All right. What does all this have to do with first meetings? Well, I kind of alluded to this, right? First meetings are typically positioned under the assumption there's some need there that the prospect has already acknowledged need. Well, surely they have a problem with efficiency. They said they could be doing better, right? That's not true. 
85% of qualified prospects actually are in a situation of latent need. They're not in a solve mode, they're in a learn or discover mode. And if you remember what the slide said, if you're in discover mode, I need to illuminate and, and help you see the problem for what it is. If you're in learn mode, I need to teach and share with you how others are solving for it, how I've helped others, but not position myself as a solution until you are committed to solving for that solution. It's very simple, but it's kind of not. Even inbound prospects are not ready to solve, right? Although they like to sound like they are, but here's the reality. Nobody's going to go to your website, click on the button, say, contact me. And when you get on the phone with them, say, hey, Bob, uh, listen, real glad, you know, you, you called me back and set this up. Listen, I want to be really candid with you. We're not going to do anything for a while. In fact, we're probably going to make a run at this project ourselves, but I wanted to call a bunch of vendors to get kind of their take on it, see what they're doing, gather information so I could look really smart to my boss, plan for budgeting and try to do it with my own resources. And I really wanted to call you guys because you're an acknowledged leader. And I figured if I waste a bunch of your time, it's going to make me look really good. Nobody says that, do they? They give you bullshit. Sorry, there's a bad word. Mission critical. It's on uh, top of our radar. It's got executive oversight. And we go, oh, great. And we start running around doing a bunch of stuff and we never ask questions like, when you say it has executive oversight, what does that mean? Have you provided with a document of specifications or any requirements that you're supposed to look for? When do you have a deliverable to go back to your executive team and present this? Who's on that executive team? Nope. We start running and saying, I got a hot lead. We put it in the, in, in the pipeline. We start calling all our subject matter experts. We need technical help. We get our smartest people in the room. We go as fast as we can, ignoring all the warning signs. Proposals out, and then it's follow up, follow up. Huh, why aren't they calling me back? Scratch, 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 scratch. Funny. I know it feels like a chicken and egg thing, right? And I'm going to show you how to get around that, right? But this is sort of how we think about the world today, right? The prospects sit in their arms closed. Well, I'll only meet with you if you can prove you solve a problem and you pitch me. But the truth is, I need to meet with you and understand your problem in order to present a solution. So what I'm going to show you, and I'm going to unpack this in a lot of detail, right? and I'm gonna make sure you have the tools to go and do this, scripts, everything, is I'm gonna show you how to beat this game. I'm gonna show you how to, for lack of a better term, turn the tables on our prospects and get them to stop acting like, you know, chicken and egg or, or, or this confrontational standoff situation and, and have a freaking conversation, right? That looks really weird how that happened. I don't know what just happened there. Um, how to have a conversation with people because you can't actually start to do discovery, understand need, help them develop their concept if you're not in a conversation and building a relationship, right? Make sure I didn't skip something here. Um, I just wanted to hammer this point home one more time. Qualification and probing for pain don't ever happen on the first meeting. If you get off a call and you say, oh, they have this, they're, they're totally qualified, they have all this pain. No, you don't, right? Any information you got from them is suspect. Even when you think you have a great conversation, you're getting surface level information, right? The reality is they don't know you. Do you really think they're sharing the truth with you, the deep truth with a stranger on a first call? So tell me what keeps you up at night. Smack, stop asking that question. But even when you say, tell me what challenges you're dealing with, I'm gonna give you a BS answer. When you walk up to somebody and say, hey, how's it going? They say, oh, good, how are you? Is that the real answer? Ask again, no, really, what's going on? How'd you say, well, actually, my daughter's kind of failing in school. My son's, uh, you know, hitting the wacky weed. And gosh, I think, I think my wife and I need to go to counseling, right? When you ask more questions, right, when trust has been built, you get real information. So stop lying to yourself and saying, I have a great prospect and they've got real problems and real challenges after talking to them for 30 minutes or even an hour, right? My model has three discovery conversations after a first meeting before I even believe We've got to the real problem, principally for this third one. Even if people are being candid with you, well, we got to tell you about this problem here. They have not thought about that problem deeply enough. They haven't gotten to enough depth in it because they woke up this morning. They had to figure out how to get out of bed, get their kids off to school, get through traffic, get to work, stressed out, answering emails and texts, not even paying attention to the road, right? Then they got into work and it's a fire drill all day long. So these things that are strategic that we really have important is, you know, those are floating around in their head, but they're not in the center of their consciousness. Thus, they're not exploring them. That's where we come in. Here's the, uh, the little word I was talking about. Everyone is full of it at the first meeting, you included. 
right? You're saying, oh, we got this great thing, it can help. This person's a stranger to you. You don't even know how they get paid, what their bonus is, what their career aspirations are, but your solution is for them, right? Nonsense. Also trade shows, by the way, that's a whole nother topic. Their problem concept evolves over time and must. More importantly, I'm gonna slow down a little bit for this. I'll even take a sip of water. You will never differentiate from your competitors based on your product or service. You will never differentiate from your competitors based on your product or service. For the simple reason that whatever you are presenting to them is at a sufficiently high level sufficient level of complexity and requires expertise, they don't have the expertise to even differentiate between the technical differences, even when we spoon feed it through them, right? I cannot tell the difference between my Sonos system and a pair of $10,000 speakers. Why? Because I've been to a lot of concerts and didn't wear ear protection and my hearing's not perfect, right? I drink box wine or you know, $12 bottle of wine. Sure, I'll splurge for an $80, $200 bottle of wine once in a while, but to be honest with you, I'm not that good at determining them. Sommeliers are because they spend all their time doing it. They tell me the differences and the nuances. That is the challenge you're dealing with is we're trying to let our product, our service, all the cool stuff we have impress them. Most of it's going over their head. The only point of differentiation, the only way customers actually make decisions between multiple vendors is they work with the vendor, they buy from the vendor, they invest from the vendor who is actually the one to help them develop the concept of their problem and then match the solution to that. Again, that's more discovery and a longer conversation, but I wanted to uh, throw that in here. You've been doing it wrong, right? You walk in your local Starbucks, you're sitting there, I walk in, and you're sitting there enjoying your nice latte, right? And I'll, I'll pick on Jorg. And I say, we've never met, right? Let's pretend we don't know each other. Hey, Jorg, Jorg, Townsend Wardlow, nice to meet you. Hey, I know your name is Jorg because, uh, hey, the name's in your coffee cup. I see you in here all the time. In fact, you're usually here Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, right? You're always in here reading the paper, New York Times, good choice, I got that. Listen, I see you drove up on that Xterra there with the mountain bike. We should really go mountain biking sometime because I'm a, I am love mountain biking. I know some great trails. I could show, I'll show you some great trails. We can even teach you some tricks and stuff. In fact, I think we're going to be best friends. Life's going to be great. And then maybe our families can get together. I know you have that kid there seeing once in a while. Whoa. How you feeling right now, Jorg? right? You're, uh, you're dialing 911 and trying to remember how you issue a restraining order against somebody, right? All this intimacy, all this push of, I know you, I can help you, I'm right for you. It's insane. That's what you sound like when you're prospecting calls. And that's surely what you sound like on the first meeting. Now, let's review the scenario. I walk in, it's a busy day. There's not a table there. And I go up to the table that York's sitting at. I say, excuse me, um, do you, you mind if I grab the seat here? Just flow and grab my coffee. Sure, yeah, okay, have a seat. What's your name? You're old towns and you're nice to meet you. Hey, cool. Hey, thanks a bunch, man. <laughs> Sip my coffee. Next week I come back. Um, it was York, it was York, right? Yeah, towns, nice to meet you. How's it going? How's life? Yeah, cool. You catch the game last night. Good day. Have a good day, man. Next day, sorry, next week, busy again. Hey, York, you mind if I catch up? More dialogue, more talk. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because I want to be sensitive to time, but the idea is, you can engineer a relationship at an appropriate level of intimacy over time, right? Not trying to slam it all to somebody's throat. When you do that, you come across as somebody that they want to hang out with or do business with maybe. When you don't do it that way, you come across as a crazy person, being presumptuous, right? Not fun. Relationships are a function of interactions over time multiplied by a plus or minus. Not going to go into a lot of detail. People say, oh, we have a great relationship. Really? How do you know? Well, you know, we, we get along eh, really fuzzy. I do a whole seminar on relationships. The point is in sales, I care about one thing. How many scheduled interactions have you had with this person and were they positive or negative? Thinking back to that map up top, right? We're proposing at most after two scheduled interactions, the first meeting and the discovery. My interaction map, we're proposing after seven or eight scheduled interactions. Who do you think has more trust? Who do you think has more credibility? Who do you think has asked deeper questions? Who do you think has asked the same questions multiple times to test for understanding, to make sure that there isn't anything else, right? That's how you win in sales. The first meeting determines the rest of your relationship because the first meeting determines if you're set up for the demo proposal, right? Down the toilet, waste your time, do nothing, no decision track, or if you're set up for the track that will allow you 
to fully understand their current situation, fully understand their desired future, help them develop their future, sorry, their, 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 their problem concept, and then present a solution. Wow, a lot of stuff, right? The first meeting is a pivot. I always say the first meeting, if done right, is a trick. It's a meeting about nothing. I was gonna put a slide showing the Seinfeld show up here, but sort of a joke. It's a pivot from interruption to relationship. In order to complete that pivot, you have to have it. You can't skip it. I don't want anything of substance to happen in the first meeting. My only goal is to get to discovery. Here's how I do it, and then we'll get into the details. It's 15 minutes long, not 16, not 18, not 30, because it was going well. It's a hard stop. It's designed to be. I'll show you how to do that. Two objectives, very simple. Run out of time, get another meeting. I want a relationship event, right? so that when I start talking, I'm at relationship event number two, and I have a chance to get some real information. Remember I said, you cannot get anything of substance on the first meeting. You can get a lot in the second meeting. The question is, how do you get there without tripping that wire that sends you tumbling down the rat hole of proposals and demos and stuff like that? The stated agenda, and again, I'm gonna go through this in detail, is I'm looking to introduce myself and my company. When you watch my prospecting video, how do you cold call or whatever the heck I call it, the purpose of the meeting that you're looking to schedule, when you say is, I'm calling to schedule 15 minutes on our mutual calendars to introduce myself and my company. It is a personal introduction. It is something that human beings, as it turns out, are very, very amenable to. It does not say my company's services. It does not say our product, what we can do, how we help people, pitching people, et cetera. It is a purely, purely personal meeting. That sounds really strange, doesn't it? Work with me. So some of you who have followed me for a while know that I'm really, really fixated on this concept of the exactly how, right? And for me, it's always seemed absurd that we jump into, you know, tell me about your problems, tell me about your biggest challenge on the first meeting, but I didn't have a... A better, a better plan. So this is what I call a conversation roadmap. I've built this pretty recently and I, I took a step back and said, what is it that can be accomplished meeting by meeting based on the, the level of intimacy, knowledge, trust, you know, that we can, we, can, we can likely capture from a conversation, right? First meeting is all about sharing our story, sharing our company story, asking questions about them personally. We might start asking about their role, responsibilities, reporting at a high level, you know, some of these things overlap. Later on in the second meeting, we can really drill into, we can ask more personal questions for one. We can drill into questions about their role, responsibilities, and reporting at a deeper level, who you report up to, where do you go for approvals, right? We can start asking about their current situation and their desired future. We want at some point ask about decision process, how does this actually happen? And really, where do they see themselves in the journey? What are they doing? What's next? Again, we're gonna focus on this first meeting here, but understand that you can use this as a map and by the way, when you, when you uh, go to the, the Dropbox folder, there's this map. The second page is actually a template for questions and, and you can actually capture the questions you're gonna ask and the answers. And the third page, I actually have the questions I use, my, 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 my best questions for each of these kind of conversations. Notice they're very open-ended questions when you see that, but that'll help in the, in the discovery process. So to get ready to hold a first meeting, you need to prepare your story, all right? If you're gonna introduce yourself and your company, you need to have something prepared for that. This is not what you do, your value proposition. This is story time, right? Stories contain humor, drama, struggle. You need to prepare your company story. Again, not what you do, but how did your company start? What was the interesting fact about the founder? Why did he get into this business? Oh, it was started in a barn, right? This is an exercise that I typically walk through with clients and help them. And frankly, if you guys wanna prepare your story and your company story, and send them to me, I'm happy to give my thoughts. But the idea is you need to be prepared, if necessary, to spend 10 minutes monologuing about yourself and your company. It's not that hard, right? You all have something about your lives that's interesting, right? It is the story of how did you get into sales? Where did you start? Where did you go to school, right? It's a personal story. Same with your company. Again, this is not Reading off the website, you're going to have to go talk to your founder or find somebody in your company that's, uh, you know, an, a, an old guard there who's been there all along and, you know, ask them, how do we even get started? Where do we come from? Anything funny in the, in, in the past that happened? Any interesting anecdotes, right? People connect with stories. I wish I could spend more time on, 
this aspect and kind of walk everybody through it, but I can't in the time. So long story short, in order to do the first meeting, before you do your next one, you need to have these two things prepared. Imagine you're standing up in front of a group, and if you haven't done like a Toastmasters or something like that, go get yourself one of those classes. And you've got 10 minutes to talk about yourself and your company, and you need to be interesting. You need to get them to laugh. You need to get them to empathize with some element of struggle, right? I have a whole story of how I started selling in bike shops. You know, I woke up one day and realized I was never going to, you know, get married or find a suitable mate making $15,000 a year, 14,400 a year to be exact, right? I used to drive an hour down. You guys have heard me talk about this crap, right? And then in terms of company, how did your company start and evolve? You need to have this prepared before you even set your next meeting. It's kind of a requirement. Last but not least, you need questions that you will use to interrupt yourself because you are not going to spend 10 minutes talking. You need to be prepared to talk for 10 minutes. If necessary, it's only a 15 minute meeting, but you need to be ready to interrupt yourself, which you will do. And I'll show you how to do in a second with questions about them. You're going to use LinkedIn. You're going to use Google. The goal is to focus on what you can infer about their story, right? The beauty is these days you connect on LinkedIn. And if you're not connecting on LinkedIn with people you're meeting with, um, I don't know what to say. You're not really meeting with them because you don't care, right? You need to connect with people. You need to have spent time in their LinkedIn profile, need to have done your research because if you're going to get to the point where they're going to actually share some stuff with you, you need to connect personally. We're human beings and we connect personally before we ever connect professionally. Getting into the details now, a um, couple things. You don't need to screenshot. You don't need to take notes. Like I said, the recording's going to go out. All of this is in the Dropbox. Literally, there's a here's how you do a first meeting. All the scripting is in there, right? You've got to do the work of your story, your company story. Everything else is basically laid out. You can freaking read from the script. So calling in, this is really important. Um, years ago, I ran a company. We did outsourced demand generation, and we got paid when the appointment was held. So when we had no-shows, there was a problem. We learned early on that the reps we were sending the meeting for would pick up the phone at 10 o'clock for a 10 o'clock meeting, call, voicemail, leave a voicemail, hang up. Oh, meeting didn't show. Well, listen, dummy, in the corporate world, in the business world, everybody's running late from the last meeting. Everybody has to hit the restroom, bio break, whatever. So this is the protocol that I've used for literally two decades, close on two decades, how you call and what you say. In the Dropbox folder, there's a document called a uh, guide to ending no-shows. It is literally a step-by-step -step process document with all the templates you need for the emails to confirm, the emails to do the reminder, the call for the reminder, all the steps that will get you to that 85% show rate. If your show rate is an 85%, get that document out, follow it to the T and you'll get there. But as far as calling in, you call it the scheduled time, plan on getting voicemail, right? Your, your, your voicemail rate's gonna be probably 65, 70% on the first dial because everybody's running late. Hey, Bob, this is Townsend calling for our 10 o'clock appointment. I assume I caught you running from another meeting and I'll plan on trying you again in five minutes or so. You can also reach me at slow down when you say your number. Seven minutes past the time, call again, no message. You'll probably be at 65% plus or minus show rate at that point. If no, then you call exactly at 11 minutes after the scheduled time. And you leave a voicemail, presuming the reschedule. Hey, Bob, this is Townsend. Sorry, we were unable to connect. I'm sure somebody died. Don't say that, but the idea is you're giving a, a face-saving way of not meeting. But I assume something pressing came up. I really look forward to speaking, and we'll send an email with a couple of available times for re reschedule. Again, in that packet, and somebody asked, uh, am I sending the link? The link will be with the recording. So it'll be later today. A um, couple hours, give me. In that packet of guide to no-shows, there are the email templates you send. And it's very important that you don't send an email that says, hey, we missed our meeting. Um, what do you think about next week? What looks good for you? You send specific times. And again, the templates are in there. So I don't need to go through it. When they answer, this is how you open the call. Hey, Bob, Townsend with uh, whatever my company name is, calling in for a 10 o'clock call. Is this still a good time? Now, very, 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 very important. If you can reschedule, do so. Wait a minute. Townsend just said to reschedule the meeting if you can. When you sense hesitancy, when you sense, you know, somebody rushing, not remembering the meeting, right? 
The goal is not to speed up and see if you can make it through and just kind of get one by them, right? That's what a salesperson does. Somebody that they're going to build a relationship with says, hey, Bob, you know, sounds like you got a lot going on this morning. Maybe, maybe crazy day. We can go ahead and push this same time next week. How does that work for you, right? You just gained, I don't know, there's no real meter for this, but you gained serious leverage against every other vendor that calls in because you did something a human being does, right? It's called caring right? Putting their interest above ours, right? Great salespeople put the customer's interests, the prospect interests at the same level as their own, not behind them, right? So don't be scared of a reschedule, right? If you prompt it. No, no, no. Today's great. That's fine. Great. Bob, I have a schedule for 15 minutes under the assumption that if we end up enjoying the conversation, we can always schedule another call to continue the conversation. I promise I'll keep track of the time. Does that work on your end? Think about that. We're telling them this is a short meeting. It probably came through as a half hour block on the invite, which it always does. They're not going to need to be looking at their watch. They know this is only 15 minutes and they're out, right? Plus, we've set the expectation for what we're going to do at the end, which is kill the call, right? The most important thing that can happen in a call is we're ending it at the highest point in the conversation, right? People always say, well, we kept going because things were going great. No, that's when you kill it on the first call. Shut it down when the enthusiasm is highest to create a desire to meet again, right? A little counterintuitive, but it works. Yeah, sure, that works. Great. Well, as I mentioned, my objectives for the call are to share a little bit about myself and uh, kind of give you a little history of our company, how we got where we are. Additionally, I'd love if we have time to hear what's new in your world. Anything else you want to make sure we, make, we cover? The answer is they're going to say, no, that sounds great. They might say, hey, aren't we going to see the product? And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, how we answer that. But the idea is, uh, no, we're not going to show the product. We're not going to pitch. This is two human beings having a conversation just like we would at a networking event. The middle of the meeting, pretty simple, right? You start telling your story. Well, I guess I'll start by uh, sharing the fact that, uh, you know, I guess, I guess as, as things go, I'm fairly new to sales, or I should say, you know, I didn't start in sales. Um, really didn't have a real job until I was 27. Um, moved out here from California, whatever the heck your story is, right? About 60 seconds, use your good judgment. You're going to interrupt yourself by asking your first question. I call this a self interrupt. It's got to sound natural. You know, I was saying, uh, that, uh, you know, funny part was my first world job. I had to drive from Boulder down to Englewood at, at the time. Again, this was 20 something years ago. You could probably do the drive in an hour these days. It's I don't know, an hour and a half two hours, something like that. Bob, I, actually, I was looking at your, your, your LinkedIn profile and, and you are originally from the upstate New York area, right? Uh, I went to Skidmore. What, uh, where'd you grow up around there? That's an interrupt. That's a diversion, right? Pay attention, listen, and ask follow-up questions. Be ready to engage. On the next slide, I'm going to show you, talk about how this pans out in real life, right? It's not always gravy. They don't always kind of, you know, take your ball and run with it and start telling their story. But keep in mind, this is the general process. Pay attention, listen. You're not waiting to ask the next question. You're actually listening to the answer they're giving you to the question that you created ahead of time based on doing some research. Be interested. My general rule is when somebody stops talking, you want two full seconds before you ask your next question. And by the way, your next question should always be a follow-up to the original, not the next question. So when they stop, tell me more about that, Bob. Hmm. Interesting. Right. You don't have to ask the next question. You can ask to hear more about the question you just asked, but you need to be prepared to go back to your story and to continue interrupting yourself after about every 60 seconds or so. That's the general process. Remember it's 15 minutes. They showed up five minutes late. There's not a lot of time to work with here and that's to your advantage. Remember our goals are, I can almost hear you run out of time. Schedule the next meeting. Here's some example questions. You need to come up with your own. You, you need to do research, but these are good ones. Wow, you've been in telecommunications for 35 years. How did you get started in that, right? That one question can consume the next 10 minutes of the conversation. Wow, Bob, you've been at ABC company for gosh, so long. Tell me about your favorite position over all those years, right? Notice these are tell me abouts, not did you do you, right? I want open-ended questions to get them talking. Get them talking. That's your only goal. You know what the funny part is? 
People love talking. They love talking about themselves. This should be easy. So now we've opened the call, right? We've done all the stuff in the middle. If you get to about 13, 14 minutes, you should get really excited because you're about to slam the door shut on this sucker and have a successful meeting by getting the next one, right? You promise them you would watch the time, be cautious of the time, protect their time, right? I want you to use these words exactly. Don't mess around with this scripting. This has been tested literally hundreds of thousands of times, right? You don't necessarily want to interrupt them, right? But you can interrupt yourself or you wait for a pause. Wow, Bob, looking at the clock, we are, we are coming up here quick on, on, on 15 minutes. I, uh, I, I promised I'd respect your time. And, and to be honest with you, I have a meeting come up at the top of the hour. I got to transition into that. But let me tell you this. I, I really enjoyed speaking with you. And I'd love to continue this conversation next week, right? How does, uh, let's just do the same day next Thursday at three o'clock sound for you, right? Not, would you like to talk again? Do you have time, specific day and time? Notice I said, week from today. Why a week from today? And what if they want to meet sooner? Let's talk about that. Every interaction I have in my sales process, I offer one week from now, generally speaking, unless there's stuff to be done in the middle. I do that because I can calibrate their reaction to urgency, right? I never offer tomorrow, right? I offer something that actually seems well, probably a little bit longer out. A week seems like a long time. Most salespeople would offer a few days. So the first thing I do as I differentiate myself, I distinguish myself from all those who are like, oh, let's talk, there's gonna be a deal, I gotta get something going, to, hey, next week, I got lots on my calendar. The mindset is what matters, right? If you are acting like an, a hungry, urgent, you know, desperate salesperson, nobody wants to talk to you, right? Nobody wants a relationship like that. Hey, this is fun, can we meet tomorrow? Right, that's creepy. Hey, this was a good conversation. I'd love to keep learning about what you're doing over there. How does uh, same time, you know, let's do next Thursday, one o'clock. Does that work for you? Right? Well, what if they say, can we meet sooner? Right? People always say, well, what if they say, can they meet sooner? Well, that's a great question. Before you answer, ask a clarifying question. Uh, well, Bob, I'm sure I can always find some time to meet. Let me ask you, what's, uh, what's kind of making you want to meet sooner than next week? What's going on on your end? Right? Understand the urgency. Don't just run over that and say, sure. They just took something you offered a week away and said, I want to do it sooner. Figure out why, ask them why, and you'll learn something. So how do these meetings actually play out in real life? Well, as you can imagine, uh, my least favorite is the dead fish, right? That's the one word answer, flat. Um, they have nowhere else, <laughs> there's anywhere else they would rather be on this call with you, and that's gonna happen, all right? Stick to your guns, follow the process, tell your story, you're going to have some meetings that just crash and burn. You call them back three months later, do the same thing, and they'll be a totally different person. That's another story. Uh, we have what I call the lawnmower. Maybe I should call it the weed whacker. Vroom, 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 right? Takes a couple cranks on it, but then it gets going, right? Off to the races. You love those. My favorite is when you kind of sit there and you're going, oh, this is going to be a dead fish, crash and burn, crash and burn. And then the motor catches, and they just freaking go with it. It's uh, <laughs> sort of like one of those, whew. They're curmudgeon, right? Why are we even having this conversation? I don't understand. I thought you were going to come and talk about, you know, uh, application software, right? That's the curmudgeon. They don't want to have a personal conversation. Well, here's the deal. When faced with a curmudgeon, the first thing to do is you need to let them own their curmudgeonitude or whatever you call it. And by that, I mean, if you're sensing that they are grumpy, impatient, not, not feeling this kind of approach, they need to own that. It's not your job to jump in and change anything. Stick to your guns. It turns out it is very difficult for people to be curmudgeon right? And they know they're curmudgeons or whatever the word is, right? At the point when they finally break and say, well, well I don't understand. What, what, what is all this about? What are we talking about? Play dumb. What do you mean? What's this about? Well, I thought we we're going to talk about database software. Oh, well, gosh, Bob, I, I guess I should apologize. I, I, I didn't come to this call planning to pitch my services. You know, heck, I don't even know you. I don't know if not your company even, even suggests that my solution is something you need. Maybe, uh, maybe call me one of those old-fashioned guys that's really interested in getting to know people a little bit and build a relationship and, you know, see if, uh, see if there's something there. Is, is that a fair approach? Right? 
put it back on them. Don't accept on face value that you're doing something wrong because you're not. You're just trying to be a human being. If they're not used to that approach because all the other vendors pitch them, don't make that your problem. Make that their problem and watch what happens. You know, the last one, of course, is the home run. And these, these happen a fair amount of time, 20, 25% of the time. One question, right? Right. You, you're doing your 60 seconds self-interrupt one question and you're shutting it down in 15 minutes. And those are so fun. They're great conversations, right? Because, um, you know, it's a home run, nothing else to do. This is stuff that's in the toolbox, right? The presentation. I have a first meeting assessment, uh, which like a manager would use on somebody else. You can also use it to self-assess. There's a first meeting cheat sheet. Here's exactly how you do it. Complete guide to any no-shows, meeting checklist, opening and closing, um, the buyer journey slide, that conversation roadmap slide, and then uh, the, the, the visual there. Um, going to jump into challenges. I, I know you guys submitted questions and stuff. One thing I want to call out, and I, I realize that I'm getting to the end of this, that uh, I didn't say in the presentation, these are not in-person meetings. I do not believe in in-person first meetings. I'll say that one more time. I do not believe, unless you're trying to do a one-call close, you do not leave your place of business for a first meeting. Why? It's too much effort. You can't get enough top of the funnel driving around to have a first meeting. Well, I'm better in person. No, you're not. Stop saying that. You're not better in person. If you're a supermodel or you're some, you know, really buff Ken dude with really white teeth, I know most of you on this call. You don't fit that description. Neither do I. We are not better in person. Okay? You are better when you can be on eight to 10 of these meetings a week because two of them aren't going to show. Two of them are going to be crap. Two of them are going to be mediocre, but four of them you can nail and move to the first discovery conversation. So do not leave your house unless it's a one call close for a first meeting, house, apartment, uh, business, whatever. Okay. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to throw them up on chat. I'll see what I can do, but I got some things to go through here. Probably another 20 minutes. I know we're running long. If you have to drop, I won't be, uh, uh, I won't be hurt and you'll still get the recording. You'll still get the videos. There's no program to buy or, you know, special offer at the end. So you're not missing anything. So, First from Jeff M. I had a meeting at my last job. My boss wanted to come on. I'm going to let you read this, right? Basically, this is the old, your boss decides he's coming and brings other people and the prospect doesn't know about it. Jeff, your boss is an idiot. That's all I can say, man. There's uh, nothing else to do except your boss is an idiot. And if you have the ability to say, no, we're not going to surprise the customer, um, do so. A lot of times though, it's your boss and you got to kind of follow along and he's going to blow the meeting and that's all there is to it. I have trouble building urgency for another meeting as well as making the prospect hungry to do business with me. Well, Nick, I, I, I hope the presentation, if you're listening, has, has impressed upon you that you're kind of coming about it from the wrong standpoint, right? Nobody's hungry to do business with you. What they're hungry for is solving their problems. What they're hungry for is getting their bonus. What they're hungry for is getting promoted. What they're hungry for is not working so damn hard all the time. So you got to shift your mindset, right? People will connect with you and want to meet with you again if they believe you're aligned with them, if they believe you care about them, if they believe you are seeing the world or looking to see the world through their eyes. Hopefully that makes sense, right? Katie, um, this was an interesting one, right? Where you go and somebody wants nothing to do with me. A um, couple things here. I would say that this is a very prime example why in-person meetings are a very poor use of time. Think about it. 15 minutes on the phone, which was originally blocked as 30 minutes on their calendar, you promising to take care of the time, you being crisp and professional, shows up as respect for them, shows up as giving them back their time. When you come on site, you got to sign in, you got to park, there's all the stuff you have to do. And then they got to get up off their butt from their desk, come over, get you, put on a fake ass smile, pretend to be interested, going, when am I going to get them out of the office, look at their watch? right? There's nothing about it that anybody wants. Worse, coffee or lunch. I have lunch and coffee with my friends, right? Not with vendors, right? Or by myself so I can have some peace and quiet. I get it though, right? It is hard to overcome because if you walk in thinking you're going to have your attention, you feel rejection. And that's tough. What I would say is when you show up, not trying to sell, but trying to first create a connection with a human being, you don't dig through your slide deck and all your value propositions. You start to look at their life. You look on their LinkedIn. You comment on their post. You engage with them somehow. 
Ah, this is this didn't really apply to uh, first meetings, but um, I want to put it anyway because it's it's going to talk about because always there's this concept of I got to go do other things. Um, I talk about this a lot in some of my other presentations, but the idea is this. There's a conversation we have, meeting, and then there's stuff that has to happen. I got to go do stuff. You got to go do stuff. And then there's the next meeting. What often happens is people say, well, I'm going to go do this stuff and then I will call you back. Or I'm going to go talk to my superiors and then let's figure it out. You need to jump in. And actually, there's a really good uh, presentation on my YouTube channel called uh, Getting the Next Schedule or something. It talks about this situation very specifically. What you need to do is master the ability of taking their inability for precision, exactly how long it's going to take, from interrupting or preventing continuity of the process, i.e. he doesn't know or she doesn't know whether it's going to take three days or five days or seven days. Therefore, oh, I don't know, so I'll call you. Well, Bob, let me ask you this. Generally speaking, how often do you meet with your boss? Well, once a week. Okay. Well, let's assume it's going to take at least a week to get this on the agenda. Let's do this. I'm going to send you a meeting two weeks from now that at least give you two meeting cycles to make sure it happens. And we'll have something already on the calendar to, you know, uh, make sure we don't drop the ball on this one. Again, I'd point you to that other presentation because there's a lot more detail in there, but there's a quick example. I've had many discoveries that I thought went well, quickly just end with, send me a proposal, I'll get back to you, right? This is gonna be a strange response, Alex. And again, you shouldn't be sending proposals on first meetings, but generally my response is, why would I do that? It kind of stops them in the trash. Well, so I can evaluate it. Evaluate it for what? Are you, are you prepared to make a decision? I don't even feel we've come across a problem we're solving yet. So this is really more of a discovery kind of concept, but the real key to that is to stop sending proposals when you don't have a full concept of their current state, desired future, and their journey on that. Had a web meeting scheduled with a junior, plant manager was supposed to be there, but didn't show, what should I have done? Well, two things. What you should have done is made sure the plant manager was gonna be there, right? Were they on the invite? Had they responded? Or was it the junior saying, I'll bring my boss, and you said, okay, that sounds great right? When somebody says, I'll bring my boss. First of all, I say, great. What's their email? I'll put them on the invite. I don't say, would you be comfortable? I say, what's their email? I will make sure they get the invite. Oh no, I'll just invite them. Great. What are you going to say that's going to make this work worth his time? Right? You need to challenge your prospect, right? Your boss is busy. We've had a great conversation. Why, why should he show up? What's his role here? And what are you going to tell him? All right. I'm the sales guy here, not you. With all due respect, I appreciate you wanting to bring your boss and I think we need him here. But if we're going to work together, we need to partner on that. Okay. Post colleague rep attrition take you. Oh, so this was one where somebody left a territory, right? You got dumped a bunch of opportunities and stuff and you had to pick them up. Well, the question, how do I use this to my benefit without annoying? Well, why would you annoy the prospect? The first thing you got to do is call them up. Say, hey, I'm your new rep. I'm taking over. Bob's gone. He's no longer here. I'll send you an email with a few suggested times, or you can do this whole thing in email for us to get acquainted, right? You annoy your prospect when you're presumptuous. You annoy your prospect when you're trying to get them to do something that's not in their self-interest. You annoy your prospect when you're pitching them on your solution without fully understanding their problem. You are never annoying the process, sorry, the prospect by using care and diligence in how you treat them, in how you communicate with them, in how you try to fully understand what they're trying to accomplish. Hope that makes sense, Jason. That is all I got. I'll take a quick look uh, at, at chat stuff here, see if you have any questions. Um, I see there's a couple in here, so I'll try to answer those, but uh, it's been fun here, right? Um, what advice would you give to someone at Inside Sales when you go to set appointments for your sales reps? Well, Matt, the deal is, um, you got to understand what kind of meetings you're trying to set, right? If you're an inside sales, an SDR, BDR, you're setting up appointments for an outside rep and your boss and your outside rep are saying, no, no, get me a meeting, get me a demo. Uh, you're kind of screwed. All right. Now, if you have an outside rep that you work with consistently, I would say, send them this presentation say, I want to talk about why this is in our best interest, right? You're going to have to drive some change, you know, from the inside, right? You have to use that first slide and say, hey, what are the ratios here? What are you seeing happening? Would we like to do better? What percent of your meetings that I set for you advance to a next conversation, advance to an opportunity, et cetera? You may have to talk to your boss about that. This is where, you know, kind of leadership from the bottom comes in. So unfortunately, if you are in 
um, inside sales, BDR, SDR role, a lot of times you're told, this is what you're going to do. Set the demo, set the demo, right? You may have to do it, right? Uh, I'm not saying get fired. What I would say is if you're with a company that still thinks about this, like it's, you know, 1995 or 2005, you can use some of these tools to start to share with people, send them to your boss, say, hey, there may be some other ways. I'm happy to have a conversation with your boss and smack them around a little bit, right? But at the end of the day, people are people. If you cannot change your environment, you need to change your environment. Say that again, because that's kind of a catchy plan words. If you cannot change your environment, change your environment. Get your resume out there, get another job, find an environment that, uh, that's going to support you being successful. What else, guys? Anything else uh, on your mind this morning? Doesn't look like it. Well, like I said, as soon as the uh, recording is up, the email will go out to you guys. So look for that later today. If, if I am not on your white list or whatever they call that, uh, please put me on there so you get it. And uh, you'll have the recording. You'll have the, uh, you know, the, the link to the Dropbox with all the goodies in it. You'll also have a link to my YouTube channel, uh, the playlist for all my other webinars. And if I can ever do anything to help you guys personally, give me a shout. Uh, my email, you guys have it from, from having received this. If you need to ask a quick question, jump on a call. I, uh, I do my best to get back to everybody just as fast as possible. Thanks so much. And uh, y'all have an awesome uh, rest of your day, rest of your week.